Hi, I'm David Coker, crew member, LST 325. And we're going to go on a tour? We're going to go on a tour of the ship. Let's go. All right, this, this ship was designed by a naval architect by the name of John C. Niedermeyer, who prior to World War II had experience as a submarine designer. And some of the things that he knew, he learned about submarine design, he put into the design of LSTs. Here you can see this double wall construction where you have an outer wall and an inner wall. And because the ship has a flat bottom, it has a tendency to flex. So you see these half rounds and I-beams that are welded into these internal bulkheads, which allows the ship to flex. And it, it does flex like this from time to time. And these function like longerons in the fuselage of an aircraft um, so that the ship doesn't rip itself apart when it's sailing on the ocean. These outer compartments can be flooded and counter flooded. If they took a torpedo or an artillery round through the outer wall, the, the similar compartment on the opposite side could be counter flooded. And as I understand, half of these compartments can be flooded and the ship will still float. If we go down this way, you can also see the I-beam construction overhead made the ship very, very sturdy. Originally, the Navy was under the impression that these ships would be expendable, that it would take one consist of equipment into a battle area, and that was its mission. Oddly enough, they built 1,051 of these ships, and only about 30 or 40 of them were destroyed, mostly by acts of God, although several were uh, attacked, and, uh, and consequently more of them on a per capita basis survived World War II than any other kind of ship that was built during the war. The tank deck is 287 feet long and 30 feet wide, large enough to carry 20 Sherman tanks that weighed 30 tons each. Usually they would go with 18 tanks and one bulldozer and the bulldozer would be used to scrape dirt or sand up to have something stable upon which to extend the bow door. There were also sometimes used what were called rhino barges, which were these 100-foot long flotation devices, and in the event that you had a coral reef surrounding an island, they would lash these rhino barges together and extend the bow ramp out on them so the tanks and the wheeled vehicles go out through the door uh, and onto the beach. Right here you can see the bottom of the elevator platform above us and you can see these yellow metal dowels that come down and act as guides. Because this was one of the first of this kind of vessel that was built, um, they had an elevator. It took about four and a half hours to offload all the equipment with an elevator. Later versions of the ship had a 60-foot ramp, and it reduced significantly the amount of time that it took to offload all the equipment from four and a half hours to about 45 minutes. Now right here we have our ship's bell, and as you see in Greek letters, the name Syros, S-Y-R-O-S. That was the name that was christened this ship with the alphanumeric designation of L-144 for the period of time that it served with the Greek Navy. And over here you can see a map that shows where LST-325 was launched from Portsmouth on the, about two miles off of Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944. They unloaded a consist of ducks, of amphibious trucks, about two miles out from the beach. Uh, the landing area was entirely too hot to bring big shifts like this in on the first day of the invasion, so they unleashed these ducks about two miles out from the beach, and they had to make their way in 
on their own. The draft of the ship is controlled with ballast water. Usually during a given landing, they would want to draw three feet at the bow, nine feet at the stern, giving a six-foot rake over the entire length of the ship. And this was done through the use of ballast water, which was pumped or evacuated using these enormous ballast pump pumps. There were two of them on board, and they could pump 1,500 gallons of water per minute. Over here we have a profile of a Sherman tank. This is the kind of tank typically that would be carried on a vessel like this. And this was, uh, this was made by uh, an artist that is one of our crew members, James Goodall, who actually restored this, this very tank at Fort Knox when he was an active duty, duty Army sergeant. Here we have an interesting artifact that was given to the ship. It is a 1954 Jeep ambulance that was formerly the possession of Bobby and Tito Steer. Tito was a veteran of LST-34. They got up in years and they decided to donate this ship to the foundation and so this is part of our permanent collection and it actually runs and I drove it last year. It's a little bit longer wheelbase than a standard Jeep to accommodate the stretchers that they would carry uh, inside. This is a display of a 20 millimeter Ehrlichen gun. These were anti-aircraft guns that were used to protect the ship. Uh, carry 60 rounds in that cylindrical magazine. And we have a mannequin that's fitted up to what a man would look like if he actually fired one of these weapons. During the war, there were as many as 12 of these on board an LST, and then other ordnance as well. Down inside this hole, you can see the auxiliary engine room. Originally, there were three 671 Detroit diesel engines attached to 150 kilowatt electrical power generators. Today, we have two of the original 671s, and one of them was replaced by a more modern engine. And we also have a large Cummins diesel engine on the fantail. So we now have four operational generators on board to produce electrical power when we are underway. Here are some parts of the main drive engines. They, were electromotive, they are electromotive diesel 567s, V12s, producing 900 horsepower at the uh, shaft. And then the, the power goes through a 2.3 to 1 fault gear reduction unit that is depicted over here on this mural. Here you see what the main drive engines would look like. And you see the fault gear reduction unit at the very end of the, of the engine. They're kind of hard to find parts for because they were made in 1942. Here we have a stretcher access. Frequently when LSTs would be coming out of a battle area, they would carry wounded and prisoners. And sometimes they would take the stretchers with the wounded and put them up in these billeting quarters. And at various points here in the tank deck, you can see these stretcher accesses where they would hand the stretchers up and put the, put the wounded into the billeting up above, in the, the racks that are in the billeting quarters. Of course, the Greek flag commemorating the 30 years that the ship served with the Greek Navy. Yeah, this is a little dining area that the Greeks built. Uh, behind this wall would have been where the enlisted men that stayed with the ship all the time would stay. And they, uh, they would be in bunks that would be four high, enough for 
about 85 men. The standard crew complement for an LST during World War II was 85 enlisted men and anywhere from 8 to 12 officers, depending upon the mission. Now this picture right here is from the very first invasion that this ship was used on. It was a part of Operation Husky, which was the invasion of Sicily on the beach at Gala. And I have a personal story I'll share with you about this picture. Uh, a few years ago, I met a man in Ashland, Kentucky named Arthur Alvey. And he was the lead gunner on a five inch gun that was on the USS Boise, which is this destroyer that you see in the background. This picture was taken from the bridge of 325. I brought him on board and introduced him to Ad Mumford, the former chief engineer of our ship. He was 90 years old. And Ad was on LST 327, and, which was also used in the Sicilian invasion. And when I introduced Mr. Alvey to Ad, he said, we saw you. We saw you from the deck of the, of the LST that he was on when his ship was shelling the shore batteries up above the beach at Gala. And then they went off into their little World War II world that only they uniquely could. And I was standing there with tears in my eyes, feeling like a three-day-old clump of chopped liver. But these are the kinds of special experiences that you can have aboard this ship that you can have nowhere else. Down below here we have dry storage on one side and refrigeration storage on the left because the galley is one level above us here. And over here I would be remiss if I did not show you these two plaques. These plaques commemorate the overseas support crew which were volunteers that went to Crete to work on the vessel and put it into operating condition in 1999. And then this is what we call the Gold Crew, who were the men that actually sailed the ship from Crete to Athens, and then to the Straits of Gibraltar, where they had spent about two weeks doing engine repairs, and then sailed the, the ship across the ocean landing in Mobile, Alabama on January 10th, 2001. Up here in the officer's country, we have the galley, which is a little different configuration than it would have been during World War II, but this is where we feed the 40 or 50 men that serve aboard 325 when we take it out on the, on the waterways of the North America to showcase it to people all across the country. It has an electric stove. It originally would have had a diesel-fired stove uh, during World War II, but now uh, we have all the modern conveniences, including a microwave oven and an ice cream machine that has become very popular. The green on the bulkheads indicate the officer's country, and down through these passageways are staterooms on either side that would have been shared by the officers who would serve aboard the ship. And at the end of the hall, you can see the wardroom. We'll talk about that later. This is the front of the officer's country. And right in here is the wardroom. And some of our crew members are in here. The wood paneling was added by the Greeks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Guy with the camera. Shut up. <laughs> now during 
World War II, there would be four stewards that worked in the galley that would bring the food for the officers forward and serve it on these china dishes that you can see on the racks here in the bulkhead. And then their meals would be served to them in the wardroom. Then they would remove the plates and cups and saucers and wash them in here and put the put the uh, back on the put the dishes back on the bulkheads. Down through this passageway, you see a mirror image of the other side with staterooms here that, as I said, would be shared by the officers. <clears throat> here we have board members and and the uh, captains that actually pilot the ship and Owen Chapman, our, uh, the, the man who runs the galley, they sleep in these sleeping quarters. Now if you'd like we can go up to the radio room, which I yeah. think is the most impressive display on the ship. And I think I'm going to hand this off to Perry Ballinger, who is our radio expert. My job, other than the radio operator, which of course uh, my, my original Navy rate was electronics technician, but having been an amateur radio operator from a young age, I, uh, I knew Morse code and so forth. So we were able to uh, do a number of things, repairs. We also were tasked with uh, being a signalman, more or less, uh, uh, taking care of signal flags, and uh, of course, a lot of our equipment is up on the signal bridge, which is two decks up from this one. So, so take what care we're of hearing it. right now, the telemetry, is that Morse code that we're hearing? In the background, you're hearing Morse code, yes. Uh, and is that still used a lot today? It's no longer used by the military. Uh, they've adapted to high-speed data type transmission and satellites and so forth. Uh, it is still taught to the military, all branches, basically, for intercept purposes, for snoop snooping, if you want to call it that. Okay. And can you give us a little demonstration of that? Uh, not the intelligence gathering. Oh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, there was receiving and typing. Uh, but if you had to uh, get on the air and use Morse code to uh, talk back to... Uh, not so much your operating fleet, but to the United States or any shore station that you had a message for, well then you, then you would actually uh, uh, operate the transmitters. So, what did you just say there? I was sending a, me uh, a message back to uh, NSS Washington D.C., which is the naval, the Navy uh, main Navy station. What is your favorite part about the LSD? Uh, favorite part really is being a part of um, a living museum and uh, demonstrating it to the public. Uh, so that's the big picture. It's it's really what we're doing, and. It's very satisfying to uh, pass along the history of a very important time in our country's uh, existence. So, What would you like to say to any kids who are just fascinated with this entire room? Well, the, uh, as far as uh, radio operation, the Navy still does it. It's in a diff little different form now, more automated. But to uh, enter into the world of uh, Morse code and uh, other intriguing communications modes. It's still available through amateur radio uh, to the most, to a large extent. Well, thank you very much for your time, sir, and your service. Well, you're quite welcome. Glad to be of service to you. And this is the wheelhouse. It is where the ship would originally have been operated from. We have a, an array of different navigational and control devices here, some of which we still use, some of which we don't. This is called an enunciator. You've probably seen these in films before. 
this device would be used to communicate with the men in the engine room because at that, at, during World War II, the men in the engine room actually controlled the speed of the engines. We don't use this any longer. Today, we control the engines using these two throttles that are hydraulic electro, electrical throttles that control the engine speed. While we are sailing, the pilot of the ship will shout orders down through this voice tube and then the three men that work in here will control the, th the throttles, will log everything according to at, at whatever time that an engine speed change is requested, it will be recorded in this log. This device right here is a gyro repeater. We don't use this anymore, but it is operational. It repeats a signal that is sent out from the gyroscope, which is in a separate compartment over here on the starboard side. And the wheel is also no longer used. There is a joystick in the conning tower up above that is used to actually control the ship. One other device that I'll point out is this binnacle. It is a floating compass that makes the correction between magnetic north and due north. And this device would be used in the event that there's a power failure and the gyroscope no longer would be operational. This is a heads up display that is our main source of navigating in this day and time. It looks like the dashboard of a fighter plane. It's just a, a standard computer screen. Um, but when we're underway, it has, it has the channel markings in the river and every other, it, you can also see where other ships are coming toward you. Like if there's a barge or a tow in front of us, it will, it will show up on the screen. This is a 40 millimeter Bofors cannon. <clears throat> the Bofors company <coughs> is Swedish. And during the war, or prior to the war, they were building these guns practically by hand. And it took almost 200 hours for the men to hand build these guns. Chrysler Corporation started building them during World War II under license and they set up assembly lines and they reduced the manufacturing time from 200 hours to about nine hours and they built them in single, twin, and quad barreled configurations. We only have single and twin barrel on LST-325. We have two twin barrels and we have four single barrel Bofors cannons. There would, be seven men, there would be seven men that would operate this gun. You would have a pointer and a trainer. One would raise and lower the barrel. One would move the gun from side to side. You would have a loader that would stand up on this platform and shove these four round clips into the breech of the gun and the rest of the men would be handing him the ammunition which would be stored in these ammo lockers that are down beneath us on the lower level. And that, and that back there is a twin barreled Bofors cannon. This is our large Cummins diesel generator that presently we're not using because it's it's got a problem with the water, uh, water filter. Up here, we have a davit holding a LCVP, landing craft vehicle personnel. The vanguard of your invasion force would go in in an LCVP. Hundreds of them were used during the D-Day invasion. They can carry 30 men or one small vehicle like a, like a Jeep and about 10 men. 
They were built by the Higgins Marine Company during World War II in New Orleans out of marine plywood. But these were built by the British. They're made out of fiberglass with reinforced steel hulls. Well, this is the main deck that you can see from this position. And during a given invasion, your wheeled vehicles, trucks, ambulances, and jeeps, anything with pneumatic tires, would be stowed up here, as many as 40 of them during a given run. And you'll notice that they have different cleats than what we had down in the, in the, in the main deck, or in the tank deck, uh, because a wheeled vehicle could run over one of these things and not crush it, but on the, on the tank deck, they had to be flush with the ground. You can see a cargo hatch right here in front of us. Uh, underneath that tarpaulin is pieces of wood that can be removed uh, and palletized containers could be dropped down through here, uh, down into the tank deck area. And here we are in the engine room. We have two electromotive diesel model 567 locomotive engines. They're V12 two cycle configuration. They produce 900 horsepower at the shaft. The power then goes through this Falk gear reduction unit that reduces revolutions by 2.3 to 1 then goes out through a 60-foot shaft that protrudes through the hull of the ship and turns the, the propellers. We had these apart a couple years, about four years ago, and they said the gears are excellent. So they've not been damaged at all. These engines, one of them is original to the ship. One of them has been replaced. And they're kind of difficult to find parts for, as you might imagine but uh, they run very well considering their age and uh, our engineering crew works on them constantly to keep them in, in a good state of repair. Very good, thank you. I wanna show you one other thing up here. This is a flywheel that was removed from the starboard main engine in Mobile, Alabama. And you will notice that only about two of the eight bolts that were holding that thing onto the crank of that engine remained intact. I point this out to people to suggest that there was an element of divine intervention involved in these men being able to uh, bring this ship all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. The average age was 73 years. And this was the condition of the flywheel when they got to Mobile, Alabama. Um, so I am convinced that, uh, that the Lord was with them on their journey. And what is your favorite part about being involved with the LST? 
just the fact that we can showcase this vessel. It's the only one of its kind, the last of the class, as one of the hats say, uh, and bring it to the inland, to the cities along the inland waterways of North America and show people what these ships were like. This is the last remaining World War II era vessels that actually operates under its own power in this part of the country. There's also a Liberty ship of this vintage out in California, but this is the only one that sails in the eastern part of the United States.